All right. Uh, okay. So, anyone reading crypto yet? A couple of you, at least one of you. You really need to read it. It's very interesting. They get into very great gory detail about the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. So, I recommend reading it. Yeah, you know, I read it at the gym. I go to the gym every day. That's really the only time I read is when I'm exercising. So, but get a chance to read it. It's an interesting book. Is it interesting so far? Yeah, I got to the public key. I've I know it's not very far, but hey, that's it's something. like 10 to 15 pages at a time. Right. So. But it's, it's interesting. And what they're doing is they make all this stuff this course is about into a story. And, you know, how it happened and why it happened. And one thing, you know, when I read it last time, you know, how would you get to the end of a book? They always got the epilogue after it. Does anyone ever read the epilogue? I usually don't. I read it this time. Wow, a whole bunch more information. I'm like, oh, I should have read it last time. But uh, now I'm reading Spam Nation by Brian uh, Krebs. He's the guy who uh, talked to, who's, who basically announced the Target hack when Target got broken into. That's a good book as well. But the problem is there's too many darn good books out there. So. Have you read the Hackers one by him? It's like Hackers, you're the... Uh, yeah, I've read, by Stephen Levy? Yeah. I've read about half of it, and I just, I got to go pick it up again. Yeah, I just, I, I that's really good too. That starts off with the Model Training Club at MIT, and that's really interesting as well. I got that off of like some book site for like three bucks. Yeah, I mean, you usually can get the book, including shipping, for under five bucks. It's usually darn cheap. I haven't got a chance to read it though yet. But there's no excuses for you guys to read the crypto book. So I have a feeling you can get it for, oh, right inside your class. It's there. So read it. Okay, so let's start talking about this. Okay. So, if I was to ask you to tell me what combination of numbers, of those numbers there, would equal 113, could you figure that up? Yeah. Yeah. You could. It would just take a little bit. But, you know, it's, but it's not hard. But what if there was a thousand numbers? Would it be harder to do? And if this was a lot larger? More right. I mean, it's not that it's a hard problem. It would just take a very long time to do. You all agree with that? Just yeah. take you a long time to do. Okay. So now let's talk about different types of problems. They do mention this a little bit in the book, but not all that much. First of all, we got what's called a class P problem. This will be on both exams, by the way. These three will both be there, guaranteed. It says a problem whose solutions run in time bounded by polynomial functions, which I do cover in the next page as well, based on the size of the problem. Okay. What that means is, first of all, there. They're easy to solve, like the one we just looked at. That was very easy to solve. There's only a handful of numbers. We could solve it quite easily. Even if I increased the number of numbers, it still wouldn't be hard. It might take longer, okay? So it's easy to solve. can be solved in what's called polynomial time, okay? The amount of time that is roughly proportional to the size of the problem. So if I told you to multiply two numbers, very small scope of a problem, very easy to do. Or how about searching for a book in a box of books? Could you do that? Mm -hmm. um, did you ever see the TV show? It was on for one season called Treasure Hunters. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there was one part in there where they actually had to go to the Library of Congress and find a specific book. <laughs> Is that a hard task? Yes. Well, no. it depends on how much information you know about. Well, I mean, even if they tell the exact book. Oh, then it wouldn't be hard at all. Right. But... If I mean, it was some way they had to decrypt the code or the location or something. But still, so even if you're looking for a book in the entire Library of Congress, even without the card catalog, could you do it? Yeah. Is it hard to do? No, it's literally just, no, nope, not my book. Next, not my book. It might take a very long time. It's not a difficult problem. It might just take a very long time. You getting that? So it's... You know, like it says here, amount of time is roughly proportional to the size of the problem. If I tell you to look through these five books, it's very small. But if I tell you to look through these five million books, obviously it's going to take you longer. Okay? And P stands for non-deterministic polynomials. It says a solution, or a problem whose solutions run in time bounded by top polynomial functions, which we know what that is based on the size of the problem, but now we're adding something here, assuming the ability to guess correctly. So if I was had the Library of Congress it, problem again, and I guessed floor 32, row 18, book number 5, 
That's what we're talking about. Assuming I could guess correctly, could have been solved easily. That's what's called an NP problem. It stands for non-deterministic polynomial. It says the non-deterministic, I had all this wording so it's easier for you to understand. It says where it's basically a fancy way of guessing the solution. Okay. So even when we get into AES and encryption protocols like that, the really good ones out there, if you can guess the answer, you know, they're easier to do. Okay. So a problem is NP if you can quickly test whether the solution is correct. Y'all remember way back in math days in high school, hopefully some of you remember that, where you could very easily test and see if you got the right answer. You should always do that. You solve it and then you go back and put it in to see if it's the correct yeah. number. That's what we're talking about. So we got the number, we got the answer, can we test it to make sure it's the right answer is what we're talking about, okay? So to test whether it's correct, without worrying how hard it might be to find it, they are still relatively easy, but only if you can guess the right solution and we can quickly test it, okay? Now it's NP complete, it can be verified, and a quick algorithm can be used to solve it. So now if we can verify it and come up with a way of solving it, now we're NP complete. NP is just the ability to guess and test it. Okay, but NP complete is verification and an algorithm to go with it. Okay. EXP is a set of problems whose solutions run in time bounded by exponential functions of the size of the problem. Well, let's talk what the heck an exponential function is. Well, y'all know what 2 times 3 is? Six. But what's two to the third power? That's eight. So it's not harder, but it could be harder. Because if I said two times a hundred, two hundred. But two to the hundredth power, now we're talking a much larger number. So you can see just by going exponential, we are getting exponentially harder. I mean, that's the term exponentially, you know, it just makes it harder. So an EXP problem is much harder. So if I want to make a good encryption protocol, probably want to go exponential because the numbers are much harder or much bigger and better. Okay. Um, this is not really on the test, but basically what it's saying is the subset. So P pro problems are a subset of NP, but is P always equal to an NP? Not always. So, and don't worry about it, it's just not always true. So it says NP complete problems do not guarantee that there's no solution easier than exponential. So it might be a very difficult problem and we cannot guarantee that I might not need an exponential algorithm to solve it, okay? It says every NP complete problem has a solution that runs in time proportional to two to the N, assuming N is small. If N is too big, well then we're talking about exponential. Now, this whole thing about threads there. Let me, let me explain what threads are, okay? Way when I went to University of Tulsa, I had to write a network sniffing program. Basically, I had to capture network traffic off of a live network, analyze it, and output the results. Easy enough to do, okay? He gave me the capture. He gave us the module to capture the traffic, and we just had to manage it from that point. Well, I wrote mine, and there was a problem with it. Does anyone know what the problem was? So I was capturing it, analyzing it, and reporting on it. It was only doing one thing at a time. It's one thing at a time. So I captured, and while I was analyzing what was happening on the network, traffic is zooming by. It's kind of like, you know, when a cop pulls you over for speeding. What about the eight other cars that just went by? They might even have been going faster. So threads, I rewrote my program after I was an idiot. I'm like, why? And I finally realized it's stupid. So what I did is I made threads. So my program did three things at one time. I had one thread that just kept reading off the network, dumping it into, at that point, a vector, which is like an array list, a fancy array. But I just kept reading it into a vector. It's all I did, kept bringing it in. Then another thread, all I did was analyze it. Then another thread would output the results. So I had three different threads going on at all times. And that solved my problem. So that's what they're talking about here. Okay? Threads allow us to do things much faster. Okay? We can, we're, you know, there really is no such thing on our computers of doing two things at the one time. But they can, they seem like they are. Okay? 
Those interceptors may use other information to simplify the task of breaking it. Um, as some of you know, lots of my personal information is out on the internet. Okay? And I found out good information. You're the one I was emailing on that, yeah. Um, I talked to the law firm, and it turns out that lawyer's no longer there. And I also talked to the Supreme Court, and they're looking into it. I mean, they're going to have to do it, but it's just yeah. <sighs> pulling teeth to get it done is what the problem is. Make sure that's an assignment for you. Well, <laughs> one part of it. It really doesn't help you with a lot of parts of it. All right, uh, so let's talk about hard problems. Some problems, like I said, are hard to solve, okay? There's no polynomial time algorithm. In other words, there's no easy way of doing it. So in NP hard problems, such as machine scheduling, bin packing, okay, or knapsack. So that thing I showed you at the beginning, that's the knapsack, the very first slide. How about bin packing? You know what that is? It's packing bins with stuff. Do you ever go to the grocery store? I'm assuming we've gone to the grocery store one time or another. Have you ever bagged groceries? I mean, your own groceries? I suck at it. When, when those guys that do it for a living there do it, they get like so many fewer bags. When I do it, it's like all screwed up. But that's what we're talking about. You know, They knew how to do it better than I do, and really it's considered a hard problem. So is it bad to have a hard problem? No, we want a hard problems sometimes. If it's always too easy, then anybody could do it. So we want difficult to solve problems. Okay. It says modern techniques are based on hard problems or NP complete problems. Now, as we guess the answer and test it, yeah, that's fine, but there has to be an algorithm behind it to verify that it's correct. Okay. Involves heuristic searching, in other words, <laughs> looking at a lot of possibilities is what it is. Now, for this, we're actually going to be looking at very small numbers, but, you know. Let's look at some of the different public key encryption systems out there. You got Diffie-Hellman, okay? Y'all know what Hellman is? What's the product with Hellman in the name? <laughs> Hellman mayonnaise, yes, it's the best. That's why I always grew up with a kid, Hellman mayonnaise. But then we have Merkle-Hellman knapsacks, we have RSA, we have Algamal, we have digital signatures, we have lots of different <coughs> problems out there, discrete laws, we have hashing algorithms. We're going to talk about quite a few of these in this class. We're going to talk about Diffie-Hellman, talk about Knapsack. My plan was to move Diffie-Hellman to the beginning of the class, but, oh, it's near the end. But it really doesn't matter where I cover it. We're going to cover hashing algorithms as well. Okay, there's something called satisfiability. It's kind of important. Uh, this won't be on the test, but it helps you understand what the Knapsack is. So the way this reads is pick... 1, 2, and 3, V1, V2, and V3, such that V1 and V2 or V3 and not V3 or not V1 is true. Okay. So do you all know what ands and ors work? With an and, what has to be true? Both sides. Both sides. So for this entire statement to be true, does V1 have to be true or false? It has to be true because it's on the side of an and. So if V1's true, then we go over here, and this is not V1, so this is false. So if this is false, if, if on the right, so let me draw it here. So if this V1's true, so if this is not true, so this is false, and this is an or, so if this is false, then this side must be true. Then it says, not V3. So what's V3? False. false. So we know V1 is true. V3 is false. So what's V2? True. true. Everybody see how we figure that out? Hopefully. Maybe. Some of you. Is anyone, no one going to admit if they didn't get it? Okay. Yeah, it's just a truth table. Because ands, like this double and right here, both sides have to be true. With an or, either one can be true. But since we knew that was true, and since that is not true, that means this one's false, and since this entire section's on one side, this has to be true sooner or later. So if this was false, then this has to become true. 
So that's false. Not false is equal to true, so that's how we figured it. So pretty easy to do. Hopefully you got that. Okay. So with a knapsack, it says pick V1, V2, and V3 from the subset of 0 and 1. Okay? That's how we read that. So pick V1, V2, and V3 from the subset of 0 and 1. So in other words, V1 can either be a 0 or a 1. V2 can be a 0 or a 1. V3 can be 0 or 1. Okay? Such that V1 times A1, we don't know what A1 is at this point, plus V2 times A2 plus V3 times A3 is equal to our target sum. That's what we did at the beginning. Okay? So, I'm going to go this way a little bit. Remember these numbers right here? So those are the A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. So what combination did we need? Did anyone ever figure that out? So we don't need 15. So we need 5, 7, 32, and 69 to equal 113. So what combination of 0 and 1 would we multiply times 5? 1. What combination of 0 and 1 would we multiply times 7? 1. What combination of 0 and 1 would we multiply times 15? 0. zero. zero. Then it will be a 1 for 32 and a 1 for 69. So we're multiplying the numbers by either 0 or 1. And we end up with 5 times 1 plus 7 times 1 plus 15 times 0, which kills it, plus 32 times 1 plus 69 times 1. And hopefully everybody knows any number times 1 is itself. And that gives us 113. It might sound like we're making it tougher than it is, but in your head that's what you were doing anyway. You were. You were adding them together, but you didn't add 13 or 15. So that's what you were doing. So let me go back to where we were. So for that, the A1 was the 5, so the V1 would have been the 1, and so on and so forth. The T would have been the 113. So we just did that. You know, everybody okay so far? Okay. So we're getting there. Now let's talk about some symmetric or secret key or private key, they're all different names for the same thing. We use one key for encryption and decryption. So we encrypt with one key, we decrypt with what key? Same the same key, which is equal to the key. So I mean, there's only one key. There are some problems with this. Anyone know what the problems are? Your key gets exposed, you're right. right, key management is a big issue. If someone gets a hold of my key, me and Matthew are communicating here using a symmetric algorithm he gives away his key. What's that do to my key? Since it's the same key, it's obviously gone. Okay. So one key for both. So if we encrypt, so if we take our pub, our pub, uh, plain text here, encrypt it with a key, that equals our ciphertext. And then if we take our ciphertext, decrypt it with the same key, that goes back into plain text. Easy enough. We've done all this stuff before. And one key per channel. So me and Matthew is one key. Me and Melissa is one key. Me and Austin is one key. So on and so forth. Okay. So it's n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Again, we've done that a couple slides ago. A couple lectures ago, I'm sorry. Public key or asymmetric. Again, you've got to remember the, the easiest way is symmetric, same key. Asymmetric, ain't same key. Okay. So a separate key for each. You have you encrypt with one, decrypt with another. Easy enough to do there. And it's 2N. It's easier to calculate the number of keys with this one. I think we did this on week one. So, All right. So we have asymmetric. And again, it's not overly critical. But we have pairs with uh, asymmetric. We have a private and a public key. As long, I tell you, there's a, that crypto book, I would say a very large portion of it is all about public key encryption. I tell you how it came about, and I'm going to put a bonus question on the test about it. It's about who uh, first came up with this. So, we've got time to figure it out. Okay. It's a good thing it's a digital copy book. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, but you need to read it because it is interesting. I mean, I, I've read it a couple times now. I've read very few books a couple times. Okay, I've read one book. Wow. Okay. Um, sorry, everybody okay on that? I mean, we. It's pretty much the same stuff here. 
the private key is kept secret, the public key is distributed, okay, so on and so forth. Okay. All right, now let's talk about the Merkel Hellman knapsack, 1978. It codes a binary message. That's an important aspect of this. It codes a binary message, okay? As a solution to the problem, it's an NP complete. We have what's called the simple knapsack, which we'll learn in a minute. Then we also have the hard knapsack, which is exponential. Then this is one-way encryption. Okay, what type of encryption is this? It's symmetric, but it's also one way. I mean, the, yes, some of the examples we use will work backwards. There's only one reason they work backwards. Anyone know why that is? Because we're using little baby <laughs> numbers. Instead of 200-digit numbers, we're using one digit. I mean, it's, you, know, you can only do so much with samples. So, but it is one-way encryption. So, should I cover that last bullet again? What type of encryption is it? one-way encryption. Everybody got that? Sure. So many people get the question wrong. It's like, it's right there. One way. Okay. One way or the other. Oh, so, okay. Here's the way it works. Yeah, what's called the general, the general, general knapsack. Given an S, which would be our simple knapsack. Oh, I wish they'd give me a clock in here. But we have a simple knapsack, which is like those numbers we saw, the 5 and the 7 and the so on and so forth and a sum, calculate or find the values for V, those were the ones and zeros, such that multiplying and adding them together, just like we showed you, they equal T, okay? So example, 9, 5, 2, and 13, and T of 24. So V would be 1, 0, 1, 1. So 1 times 9 plus 0 times 5 plus 2 times 1 and plus 13 times 1 equals 24. See how we did that? Easy enough, okay? So then there's 9 times 1, so on and so forth. It's MP complete as long as you can guess the value of V. We guessed it. Now we had to use our brains a little bit. But we were, if you think about it, we were looking at it and guessing 0 or 1. Well, here we just read it, but we could have guessed the other way and realized it didn't work. Okay. So we also need what's called a super increasing knapsack. All right. The simple knapsack needs to be in super increasing. Super. The simple knapsack needs to be what's called super increasing. It's hard to say. Okay. And what the second bullet means, every number is greater than the sum of all the prior numbers. That's what that second bullet means. So in other words, we start with one. Then we got a 2. Is 2 greater than all the prior numbers added together? Well, there's only a 1. So yes, 2 is greater than 1. Is 5 greater than 2 plus 1? Yeah. yeah, 5 is greater than 3. No problem. Is 13 greater than 5 plus 2 plus 1? Yes. yes. That's what's called a simple super-increasing knapsack. The numbers continually increase. So each number has to be larger than the sum of all the prior numbers. If it isn't, you have an issue. Well, I know. I put them in the wrong order. Uh, they, they actually were. They were just in the wrong order. I don't know why they were put that way on there. But if you put them in the right order, if you had 2, 5, 9, 13, they would still work. But, yes. Yeah. It's just, uh, I, I don't know why I never fixed that. But, oh, there's a few slight issues with these slides. But I've only been using them for 10 years. Why well, fix them now? So we should always, always look forward to being yes. super. Yes, they're always this way. Now, if they're not, like say if I had a 1, 2, 3, and 13, would that be super increasing? No, because 3 is not greater than 2 plus 1. If it's not super increasing, you could possibly come up with two answers for the problem. That's not good. You don't want two answers for an encryption problem. You want one correct answer. If you have two answers, that means there's... Uh, yeah, very big problems. It says a sequence SJ is called the super increasing if all that stuff. When I was in Tulsa, we had to learn that stuff, but we're not doing that here. See, okay, that's the end of that set of slides. Let me stop this recording.